So I think we can perhaps get started, everyone. Um, welcome to this event on uh, practical perspectives on decolonizing global health. Uh, my name is uh, Osman Dar. I'm the One Health Program Director at uh, Chatham House, the Royal Institute for International Affairs. Um, and I'm joined by my co-chair, Dr. Ngozi Rondu, who's an associate fellow um, here with us at Chatham House and an erudite scholar on all on all uh, issues global health. Uh, welcome, Gozi. Uh, we also have a bunch of exciting speakers today. Uh, I think we've uh, got quite a good crowd now that's joined us, so we can probably um, get started. Um, we're pleased that this is an official event, side event of the first conference of public health in Africa, uh, and we really hope that we're uh, setting the tone for the rest of the conference um, with this with this very important topic, uh, and uh, and yeah, we want we want this to be a, a thought provoking session. You know, uh, don't we don't want any of the speakers uh, the, the the hold back. We want uh, informative, thought provoking questions from the audience as well. So we're we're looking forward to a lively discussion and debate. Um, just as a bit of background. Um, we're a part of the Pandora Initiative as well, um, and and this this event is supported by the Pandora Network, which is a which is a partnership of the uh, between Europe and Africa, between research institutions in Europe and Africa, supported by the European Commission of European Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, where we where we look to partner and twin European institutions with African institutions to to conduct uh, cutting edge research, um, primarily on the continent, primarily within sub-Saharan Africa. So that's a program that's been running for, for a number of years and we'd encourage you to go and look at the Pandora network and the Pandora website to look at the types of research projects in the global health space that have been on, ongoing. Uh, that, that Pandora network also takes a sort of a one health lens. So we look at issues at the interface between human, animal and environmental health. And we'll be taking a little bit of that kind of a perspective to this um, to this seminar and this event as well. Um, so without further ado, we can get started. Just as a bit of housekeeping, uh, there's interpretation available for listeners in, in both uh, in three languages, English, Arabic, and French. So please use that facility if you, if, if you need to. Um, and we'll have links to all the papers, um, to some of the papers of, of, of the authors that are, that are relevant to this this uh, to this topic that we're discussing today, um, and and actually Dr. Ngozi has, has also done some work in this space, particularly around um, uh, decolonizing the funding of global health, and be good to hear uh, some some words uh, of wisdom from her as well on that before before we get started. So I'll just hand over to Ngozi, and she can uh, tell us a little bit about herself and her work as well. So over to you, Ngozi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Osman, and thank you so much for bringing us all together um, and for your leadership in Pandora. I think this is um, a great opportunity for us to talk about the, the many levels of uh, decolonizing global health. And as you said, Osman, um, funding is part of it. Uh, so I think it was about almost a year ago. Yeah, that some colleagues and yeah, it was in February. Um, some colleagues and I um, had seen um, an announcement for um, the, this new funding for malaria. And all of the, it was about $30 million. Um, expert and experienced folks that we'll be speaking with um, during this webinar, um, they'll talk about the different aspects. It's not one funding call, it's not one project, it's the, the system, it's a structural um, makeup of global health, health in a lot of ways that actually extracts and it sets up very inequitable partnerships. So in that letter, um, which we call open letter to uh, funders of international um, science of uh, uh, international funders of science and development in Africa, 
uh, we, we questioned um, this funding structure and we really called on them to change this model um, because if they're the ones handing out the funding, then all the, all the institutions kind of fall in line and this inequity perpetuates. So that's, that's the little contribution that we did, but I'm really excited to um, introduce the other folks in the uh, webinar who will be speaking to us from their perspective and the important writing that they're doing um, specifically about how we make this practical where it's not just, you know, Kind of talking about all of the challenges of um, colonialization and, or coloniality and global health, um, but how we move on from that. Um, Osman, is it okay if I start with the introductions or should I hand it back to you? No, no, please uh, go ahead, Gozi. Sure, thank you. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to give brief introductions, but I'm really excited today. Um, my first speaker will be Dr. Michelle Khan. She's an associate professor of health policy and systems research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she's also an associate fellow at Chatham House. Um, and her topic will be around the challenges when addressing power imbalances. We also have Dr. Samuel Olti. He's a senior program specialist at the International Development Research Center and member of the Global Health Decolonization Movement in Africa. And his topic will be about targets and strategies of the Global Health Decolonizing Movement in Africa. Then we have Dr. Oswaldo Santos Paquiro. He's a professor at the School of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science and at the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University, at the University of Sao Paulo. And his presentation topic is about not global, not local, um, but really looking at the one health system and the peripheries and how um, we decolonize those things. And then we have Dr. Mosaka Fala. He is a technical assistant country, he's on the technical assistance, apologies, country engagement team. And he's the lead for saving lives and livelihood programs within Africa, within Africa CDC. And he's also the founder um, and CEO of Refugee Place International. He's written extensively about um, community-led outbreak response, and he'll be talking about the decolonial, the decolonial aspects of outbreak response. And finally, we have Sanjita Shashikant, who is a legal advisor and coordinator of development and intellectual property um, in the intellectual property program for the Third World Network. Um, and she'll be presenting on vaccines as a global public good. Okay, so each one of our um, participants today for this part of the um, webinar will be um, giving about a five minute intervention. Um, so let's start with Dr. Michelle Khan. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, it's a real honor to be uh, with such excellent speakers and chairs. So I'm going to start just by sharing my screen. a few slides to um, talk through this. Time to go through a whole bunch of um, challenges, power dynamics, and, and to decolonizing um, global health. I suppose I should start by saying that a lot of my um, work in, has stemmed from sort of personal experiences of being a Pakistani working in global health, but also observing and, and being a beneficiary of being um, based at both London School and at Chatham House. And, and those the dynamics that one um, views there. So so that's what it's built upon. I'm going to dive um, as a presentation. I wanted to um, I'm offering some practical suggestions. So wanting us to take a step back and and just think about when we're talking about global health and and decolonizing. What we what is what is global health? Um, and, and I often put these out to, to students as well when they're starting courses in global health. So one uh, definition is um, and consider it term that's used for branding of work, um, really focusing and concentrating policies and you know a completely different view and perhaps opposites in terms of what global health um, is is there to achieve. Irrespective of you know where we think of what we think of doing or where it is, there's taking a step back, it's clear that there is a domination, whether it's a the location of journals, so conferences, 
academic institutions, some of the leading NGOs, um, is sort of Europe-centric, Europe and US. So, so that is that is the case. So that's something we need to go into thinking about global health and, and what what is being from it. So one of the other reasons is asked to talk here is because um the early in the year to really sort of try and set the tone for twenty twenty one after so many statements about decolonizing global um, in twenty twenty. So often some companies um had as focus on how to move your point but raise my and a first practical suggestion is, um, and that's around the fact that when we do talk about decolonizing global health, it's important to know that, that even though we are together on this platform discussing it, not all stakeholders will necessarily be supportive um, of the decolonizing agenda and power sharing, because naturally power sharing means people will be having to give up power, and that is that is not something that happens naturally. Um, and often these discussions, when, when they include issues of racism and other discrimination, there will naturally be conflict and discomfort. So that's something that we need to go into thinking about and, and being aware of. And lastly, we need to really dispel this myth that, that global health is all about health equity and capacity building. Health for the many layers that it has in it, then we can start framing arguments about equity and power sharing um, in ways that only are only about um, justice because not everybody is going to be um, swayed just by that argument, right? So the arguments for rebalancing of power and attacking some of the prejudice that we see in global health. There's naturally a, a justice angle to it, but we can also think about it from an effectiveness point of view. Are we going to be effective at achieving some of the global health goals that we have um, if, we, if we don't tackle some of this? And for example, if we continue to take the view that expertise is held in certain regions or countries, we fail to learn from other examples. And COVID has made that abundantly clear, and I won't have time to start going through those examples. But the, the point I really want to stress here is that from a justice angle, it's really important to understand that the rebalancing of power and, and tackling prejudices is where we're going to be more effective at achieving some of the global health goals that we, that we have. Um, and I'm, I'm quoting here from um, a, a paper that was probably one of my favorite um, papers on this topic. Um, so one, and it, it's highlighting one of the formidable barriers to equity in global health is the fact that there's this implicit function and re reproducing existing, um, as well as the explicit goal that we have about health and equity. So let's. Um, so my second practical recommendation is to start thinking about these um, the implicit functioning and how um, what who we consider experts in health because that really uh, leads to some of these. This is my final second to time. So, who who did an should we we consider some of this? So, I'm I'm not holding back here, and I'm very aware that I am speaking on Chatham House as a, as a platform, and I'm I've been to be. But let's um you know let's think about uh, expertise and and who gets to be considered an expert. Often it's somebody with a lot of publications, it's people that you see delivering keynote speech, speeches, they'll be quoted in the media, they typically have a degree from one of the leading, you know, high brand value public health schools and sit on editorial boards, etc. and in senior positions in their organizations. So naturally, it, it makes sense that these are markers of expertise, but it's really to bear in mind that a lot of these markers that we use, if we take public it's quoted as an expert in the media, there's abundant evidence that people of color and low income nationals get, get disadvantaged. So therefore, if you see somebody that's got less of this, it's not necessary that they're less of an expert. In fact, really great local knowledge and really great expertise, but often the markers that we will that it is 
generally the white males that 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 come out as the experts. So it's really important for us to reconsider um, as experts uh, when we're planning conversations about and steps towards global health. So so thank you for for giving me the space to say this and I look forward to this. Thank you much, Dr. Michelle. Um, I think that was very enlightening, um, especially that last slide, very striking. Um, so we'll move on to uh, Dr. Samuel Olti. Thank you, Ngozi. Can you see my screen? Yes, you can see it. Great. All right, it's uh, really a really pleasure to be here and thank you to the, thanks to the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, let me start by saying that I appreciate the good that global health has done uh, for the world. Um, and I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't say that I have personally benefited from, from this good. Um, as a child born in an African country that till this day has no capacity to, to manufacture its own vaccines, I received all my childhood vaccinations, every single one of them, uh, thanks to WHO's expanded program on immunization that was launched a few years before I was born. Uh, and after I graduated from medical school, my first job was in a rural hospital that, even though it was literally in the middle of nowhere, it had quite impressive infrastructure um, because it had been uh, upgraded with the support of international health funders. Uh, and, and I decided to pursue a PhD. I was privileged to get a full scholarship uh, at a European university while still keeping my job in Africa, thanks uh, to a North-South uh, Global Health Partnership. So just because I'm an advocate of decolonizing global health does not mean that all I see is the bad and ugly. I have benefited from the good of global health and I know from the progress that we have made on many issues such as under five mortality, HIV control, et cetera, uh, that global health has not been an abject failure. Even the fact that the world has vaccines in record time from this horrible pandemic, to me, that's a phenomenal global health uh, achievement. But then, you know, because a car can move does not mean it doesn't need to be serviced. Uh, and as this pandemic has revealed, the global health vehicle is undeniably in need of, of servicing. And that's what our movement, uh, the global health decolonization movement in Africa is, is agitating for. Uh, and as part of this agitation, we have developed what we call common sense approaches to decolonizing uh, global health, a pragmatic guide for high income country practitioners and institutions and is available on our website. Uh, but now in preparing for this panel, I found myself at the crossroads about elaborating on the contents of, of those guidelines because it would in essence mean that I'll be directing my intervention today primarily towards our colleagues from the Global North. Um, and, and I hate that term, Global North, Global South, but that's a conversation for another day. But honestly and respectfully, I don't think that's a good idea because believe it or not, in the aftermath of, of us publishing a commentary about those guidelines in the BMJ Open, we were accused on social media of perpetrating historical shaming, uh, of promoting an adversarial and unhelpful oppressor versus oppressed divide between the global north and the global south. And in fact, one commentator said, and I quote, such approaches are unhelpful and ironically colonial. So we were being now called the colonialists. So, so I'm sorry, but I just don't have the appetite to expose myself to that again, at least not today. I still need a little time to recover from that trauma. So, so what I'm going to do rather is to, uh, to digress a bit and then embark on what I call a strategic round uh, and sound a call to action primarily at my colleagues in the global south and, and particularly those in, living in Africa where I have my expertise. And, and to my fellow Africans and, and other people underrepresented in global health, I'd like to challenge those of you who are knowingly or unknowingly accomplices of coloniality in global health. These are those of you who are benefiting from the power imbalances. You are basking in the, to in the glory of tokenism. And you're very quick to rubbish the colonization movement because you want to impress your international suitors. And I want these people to remember two things. Uh, look at my screen, look at that picture, never forget where you have been placed in the hierarchy of humanity. 
look at that illustration in front of you and let, let that reality sink in. This is how you are thought of. And don't forget history. Slave trade and colonization might not have succeeded as well as it did if it weren't for local accomplices. So I call on you, whoever you are, to make a conscious decision to use your position of privilege to join us in our efforts to shift our imbalances in global health. Now, to my other fellow underrepresented in global health people who are simply afraid of speaking out about decolonization, I like to say that I can relate to the fears. When, when GHDM Africa was formed, two of the founding members abandoned us after they got lucrative jobs in global health. And they both told us in very clear terms that their kids did not have trust funds, and so they did not want to do their jobs. Now, they not, have, not at all, I understand where they are coming from. But having said that, I want to call on them and anyone up there who, who wants to see a new global health order to find your voice. Aren't you tired of your local expertise and knowledge being undervalued? Aren't you tired of being subjected to a demeaning level of accountability by your international partners? Aren't you tired of having your capacity built for years and then overlooked by the same funders that paid for your capacity building? <laughs> well, if you are, then GHDM Africa is the platform you to strategically express your discontent. And we hope that our platform will be replicated in other regions in the global south. I assure you that you will not be alone. Our platform is about strength in numbers. We believe that through strategic communication and coordinated ad advocacy, we can speak truth to power. Because let's face it, our voices are all we have. And when we talk about practical recommendations, this is our practical re recommendation. We don't have the economic, academic, or political power to dismantle, reimagine, and reform the global health landscape like some theorists have called for. And obviously we can't rely on our governments either. Many of them have failed us miserably when it comes to healthcare and to, to health system. So that all we really have are our voices. As, and so we have to come together and speak with one voice. Uh, let's not get distracted by these scholarly debates. As valuable as they are, or this false dichotomy pitting pragmatic action against conceptual frame. Let's leave those fun and games to those that are in positions of power. Look at the screen and don't forget where you have been placed in the food chain. I want you to get uncomfortable and join us in speaking out. And to our colleagues in the global north, uh, you know, as Audrey Lord said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So we can't really uh, realistically expect that those that hold power will, will dismantle the very structures that, that prop them up. We can only hope for your critical allyship, as Ajayi Abimbola called it. Uh, and for authentic partner, partnering in this journey to decolonize global health. And we hope that you create more forums like this one where we can freely, I hope, uh, express our discontent to the world. So, so that's our grand and practical plan. Nothing fancy because as people without real power or agency, all we can realistically do is to huff and puff until the house of straws comes tumbling down. And, and if it turns out that the global health house is, is built with bricks, as we all expect that it is, then, then at least history will be kind to us for, for trying. Thank you, and back to you, Ngozi. Samuel, um, I just want to, I mean, I think that was really powerful. And I also think that, you know, I want people to hold back. If you're, if you're getting uncomfortable, it's great. Um, there are question and answer, um, there's a question and answer area that you can place your questions and answers or your questions and we will answer them um, after all of the speakers have spoken. So just wanted to remind people of that. Um, it's okay to get uncomfortable to make things better. Okay, so now over to our next speaker who is Dr. Oswaldo Santos Paquero. Thank you very much, uh, Negosi, Osmar, Scott, and all the Shotgun House and Pandora for organizing and inviting me to this meeting whose title is quite provoking because uh, before thinking and sharing practical experiences, we must see if the colonial and global are compatible terms. In a sense, the colonizing global health amounts to the globalizing global health to make health not global. Furthermore, the deglobalization of health is not necessarily a process of localization. It is not necessarily a movement to make health local. So in a sense, the colonial health doesn't need 
to be global or local. Let's try to understand why, starting with uh, some metaphor uh, of the globe discussed by Bruno Latour and other scholars. Globalization and globality refer to the globe, to the blue planet seen from the outside. Remarkably, the image of the globe is an achievement of a particular way of understanding reality and science. It is an achievement of the modern ideology, which produces knowledge about external objects. Often, things uh, are taken as objective, as independent of external observers. The globe is such an external object, and we have learned a lot about it. But there's a big difference between, on the one hand, the globe, that external object following universal laws irrespective of human vicissitudes, and on the other, the earth that we compose and react to us. The modern ideology deals with external objects and takes them as resources to produce goods for consumers. It is in this context that modernity seeks to dominate the globe, to dominate nature as something external to exploit. Globalization, instead of being an opening to world diversity, have been a violent imposition of modernity, a very limited and local ideology at the service of a very small group of privileged people that self-proclaim as superior and see capitalism as the only path for human flourishing. The problem is that in modernity, some are more humans than others and being subhuman or not human is an extremely vulnerable position. Modernity, coloniality, whatever you call it, has tortured human and non-human beings on an unprecedented scale. Under modernity, with its supposed rationality, we must continue pursuing a progress for the few, exploiting the many, acting as if there were many globes with resources to back such a megalomanic endeavor. Localization, the opposite process of globalization, is condemned by this as primitive and underdeveloped, and it may seem like the only alternative to globalization. However, we don't need to believe that reality offers us only those two things. Furthermore, phenomena are not purely global or local. The globalization that reach other localities is not simply absorbed and amplified or totally blocked. It is refracted, it is transformed at different extents. That mixture, which can be more globally or locally laden, is sometimes called localization to refer to the process or locality to talk about the condition. If coloniality underlines globality, the coloniality underlies locality, and there is no pure expression of any of these conditions, it follows that health can be totally deglobalized or decolonized. However, it can be decolonially laden as is the case of one health of peripheries. Before pointing to some reference uh, uh, about one health of peripheries, it is worth noting that mainstream one health often uh, described as an intersectoral approach to take care of health at the human animal uh, environment interface shares features with other colonial health movements. As documented by Latin American studies, 
capitalist exploitation can increase social conflicts to the point of threatening elite interests. To avoid that, colonial actors take advantage of their positions to impose and direct social reforms without compromising wealth accumulation. As unhealthy conditions prevail under exploitation, health reforms have been a key component of colonial influence. It's in this context that preventive medicine and public health were introduced through uh, institutionalized efforts in Latin America. More recently, with the intensification of emerging diseases and climate change, one health and planetary, uh, and planetary health have come as new flavors of a colonial order that is far from the health needs of marginalized multi-species collectives. One Health of Peripheries refers precisely to experiences, understanding, and transformations to the colonially promote well being of marginalized multi species collectives. It is an emerging field of practice, praxis in which uh, action is informed by knowledge about the pathological effects of marginalization and knowledge is built on actions against marginalization. Uh, we propose seven actions to promote one health of peripheries, deconstruct marginalizing apparatuses, enrich the, uh, the ecology of knowledge, build healthy multi-species public policy, create sporting environments, strengthen multi-species community actions, develop individual capabilities in multiple, multiple species and reorient multi-species health services. As I have no time to talk about marginalizing apparatuses, the meaning of peripheries, ecology of knowledge, and uh, many other key ideas of one health uh, of peripheries, I'm going to point you to a couple of papers that gives you a background about One Health of Peripheries. Let me share uh, my screen. Uh, I think you are seeing. Well, this is one of the papers that talk about One Health of Peripheries, specifically uh, about biopolitics, social determination, which uh, is different from the social determinants of health popularized by, one health, by the World Health Organization. And in this paper, um, I also talk about the field of praxis. The other one uh, is this, from modern planetary health to the colonial promotion uh, of one health of peripheries, which in a sense is a continuation of the other one. And uh, in our web page, uh, which is in the, the domain, is in Portuguese, but uh, you also find there an English and Spanish version. You, you, you can uh, find um, theoretical and applied research as well as community uh, based uh, work we are doing. And I guess uh, by January, uh, we will have a fully updated uh, English version. So uh, that's it. And um, thank you very much. It goes. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Oswaldo. I, I think it really, I think, expanded this conversation, especially thinking about modernity um, and coloniality and what comes along with that. And it's, it's, you know, global health isn't in a bubble. And I think you really brought that out um, and, to, and to bring in how that affects everything. And, you know, and so that's super important for the One Health um, anchor in this conversation. So thank you for that. Um, and now we have our next speaker who is Dr. Mosaka Fala. Thank you very much, Nosi. Thanks for this opportunity. I was asked to speak on decolonizing uh, public health response. And I probably will start with uh, my experience in the DRC Congo in 2018. 
my recent experience um, when I went to visit Sierra Leone on behalf of Africa CDC following the fire fire uh, catastrophe. A little bit about Liberia, and I will conclude on what we at Africa CDC call the new public health order that tried to decolonize uh, global health. So in 2018, I was in the DRC. I had gone to assist with the Ebola response. And there were a lot of meetings. I decided to visit the communities and talk to the people. I had one of my colleagues from WHO Asia who said, I want to move to Potumbu. He said, Mosoka is going to be risky. You will lose your life. Whenever I'm in Potumbu, I have to be in the military. But I decided to go around to talk to people, people that were involved in some of the attacks. And I went to the border between DRC and Rwanda. I wanted to get a feel of what the people were feeling. Were these people very irrational to the extent that they would attack response workers? Or were there online news nuances that were not picked up? And basically, in conclusion, when I told my colleague who was heading the US CDC team in Congo that this was basically an issue of the Ebola economy. He said, what do you mean by the Ebola economy? I said, I'm going to tell you a couple of things. I said, we brought in over 200 anthropologists. Those anthropologists come with their SUVs. To the extent they bring their cokes and their drawers from foreign places. The people cannot even afford a dollar a day. We want to work with these people. They have no incentive for this response. We've even brought in foreign doctors to run the treatment unit when an Irish Congolese doctor makes around 300 US dollars a day, a month. So basically, the entire response is about moving wealth back to the West. These people don't see the wealth of this response trickling down to them. And so they have no incentive. I said, pray tell me, this guy is part of the Mia Mia, the, the, the rebel group, the mafia group. Do you think if his brother, who's sent supporting his kids, was a cook for one of our international anthropologists, would he want to attack that person? I said, no, he wouldn't want to attack that person because some of the billions of coming in for the response is benefiting him. But what they see from afar off, a group of international interventionists have come in with their expensive SUVs, never interacting with the people, and they are moving and removing out millions and millions of the response. And I was at another meeting when the Minister of Health spoke that every time there was an outbreak in a part of DRC, you have around 50 to 200 cars. When the outbreak got ended, and that place was left, it was worse than the time before. Whenever there was a second uh, Ebola outbreak, there was no infrastructure in place, no capacity in place to mount a robust response. So there was this vicious circle in the DRC Congo, no capacity built, no infrastructure built, and so the, the outbreak continued. The people continued to attack the response worker. Of course, we come up with a single narrative that the people don't know what they want. They are just evil but we never spoke from that, from, from that perspective. The more I went deeper to talk to the market women at the borders, there were a group of ladies who were managing market between Uganda and DRC and Rwanda. They understood the solution. I met pastors who had access to the market, they understood the solution. Nobody would speak to them because there's a superiority of knowledge, there's a power imbalance, and always about their they come with the millions of dollars, they bring the millions and the millions go back. So there's no incentive, even after the outbreak ends, the infrastructure is not left better, it's left worse. Then let me share for you to Sierra Leone. Recently I was in Sierra Leone as part of my job with Africa CDC to assess the vaccines. And a couple of colleagues invited me that there were a team of experts from the UK that were about to return. I said, what, why are they in Sierra Leone? Oh, they came to help us with the fire incident. I said they came to assist the fire, they say yes, but they are taking back all of the equipment they brought. I said to them, I said, so there were about 150 deaths. Free time. I said, have they left the capacity to build better mortuary? He said, no. Have they left the capacity for us to be able to respond to fire incident? No. Have they left one brand unit? He said, no, but they are going back with all of their equipment. So that is exactly the duplicity we follow. So the West will always have to respond to all of our outbreaks 
without building our capacity to respond robustly. There has to be a continuous need for us to for us to depend continuously for the minimum of, of response. In my own life working in Liberia, when I came back to working in Liberia with the Ebola outbreak, I saw that happen. I remember a lady said to me, who looked at my period, me and the expert. I was in the field every day working, and the expert was now ever on the field. She told me, do you know this expert makes 10 times what you make? <laughs> and you are making Field. And what was funny was when I was responding to the outbreak in West Point, my colleague from Debbie issue told me, you need to abandon these people. They can't be rescued. I said, no, these are my people. I'm going to stay. I'm going to work with them to change this outbreak around. And he said to me, you are going to die from Ebola. I said, well, if I die, I'm saving my people. We stay in. We change the situation around. We resolve the crisis. And then my colleague was about to go back to the, to the U.S. She said to me, can I take a ride in West Point with you? I said, please do. And she sat in the car and were taking photos <laughs> to take back home to go glorify. And I said, are you getting down with me to walk? I said, because every time I come to these places, I get down, I know the people. She said, no, I don't want to get down. I just came to take photos. That's a symbol. She's going to go back and it's going to become an expert on Ebola in Africa. She's going to go over six figure salary. But as when we come to global response, there is a continual tendency for us to never build the capacity of this country to be able to respond robustly. But doing that, we are going to going to give our have jobs and make fabulous salaries. So there will always be a continuous gap in adequacy of need. We will not build capacity so they can be better, so that we can continuously fly in as experts, parachuting at the end of the day in Liberia. 2.4 billion dollars was spent to end Ebola. And I asked my colleague, 2.4 billion? Can you tell me how that money was used? Can you tell me how much of that was used to build this country better? So it's the whole about the economy, it's the whole about the knowledge, superiority, it's, it's, we gotta be dependent. That has to change. So when I moved to Africa CDC, the first time I met my boss, Dr. John, and he was speaking about a new public health order. And I said to myself, this is what I wanted to do all my life. The first thing he said, the West, we have to respect our aspiration. It may be high, but we have aspirations. The second thing he said that really moved me was, you cannot give me the ingredient and join me in the kitchen to cook. They continue to join us in the kitchen to decide how to respond. So there are four main components of the new popular health order we at Africa CDC push. The first and foremost, we want to build our national public health institutes. As our agent to respond to future outbreaks, our goal is every country on the continent so that this dependency will start and this issue of colonizing response will start. We want to have autonomy too. We want to build our workforce so they can be better and competent enough to manage outbreak that will reduce the amount that go to the West. And tell it, we want to build the capacity so that we can manufacture what we need for our health security. We saw what happened. We couldn't get diagnosed during the COVID-19. 99% of our vaccines are imported. Our aspiration is that we want to be able to build capacity as a continent. So if you like us and you want to, you want to decolonize this whole response, help us build capacity. It is not fair that 99% of our vaccines are imported. And finally, what we are asking for in the new public health order, we want an action oriented respectful, transformative partnership. Respectful, action-oriented partnership. Do not go back home and write that you're doing so much so well, you publish all the papers, and one of them did it to me. I was working on a proper, she wrote the entire article and said to me, Musuka, can you read it? And can you read and put your name? And I said, do not insult me. I went to the same school you went to. How in the world you read a paper out and you want me to read that paper and put my name as a co-author? Why wouldn't you want us to sit together, design and write the paper? It's the kind of partnership we are asking for. 
the one that is respectful of us and our aspiration as a people, as a continent, the one that is action oriented and the one that is transformative. So that after every outbreak of, or every area of pandemic, we come from there better. Then we're talking about the issue of global health, but it's equity. When we have that partnership that respect us and our ideas and aspirations, it gets better. In summary, I've seen many outbreaks, I have many response. We need to change the way it is done. It cannot be driven by economics so that one could get the wealth and the countries are left worse. The country are left needy so that they can again send for international experts to be flown in and parachuted. We have to change that. And so the new popular health order we are asking for, you join us and you respect us and you support us. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Musaka. I was, um, my chest was getting very tight while you were talking because we, we are in the same field, even though you're much more advanced, but I just have seen so much of what you uh, very well described um, regarding the Ebola e economy. So I, I thank you for the descriptive illustration of what colonialism or neocolonialism looks like in terms of outbreak response. Um, and I think we're all seeing that today with COVID-19 and the inequity. Um, so before I get to our last uh, speaker, I just want to remind everyone about the question and answer session. Um, we're going to have a good, you know, 20 minutes to look at your questions and respond to them. So please, if you have anything for um, any of our speakers who have just gone or, or for Sanjita coming up, uh, please put that in the Q&A. Um, and so now I am going to pass it over to our last but not least speaker, uh, Sanjita uh, Shashikant. I hope I, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Sanjita, apologies. Hello. Um, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me on this panel, um, you know, to discuss this very, very important issue as we see uh, much of the knowledge and a lot of this is a lot of hypocrisy that we actually see happening around COVID-19. And this is what I want to talk about. My presentation is really going to focus on equitable access and actually a very specific proposal that is being moved at the international level. So I think it's now all very recognized that, you know, and from the beginning of the pandemic, it has been recognized that equitable access is really fundamental to controlling this pandemic. And we saw, and we were very hopeful because at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, many calls of international solidarity, um, especially made by the European leaders, you know, President Macron, uh, President von der Leyen, uh, and uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, uh, globally, other leaders as well, but I think it was more prominent from the uh, EU, uh, you know, the, the call for international solidarity, um, ACTA was set up, COVAX was set up, and there was this call of how human health cannot be uh, appropriated, that all of these will be universal access, global public goods, but actually what we have seen is really a lot of talk and very little in terms of action, um, there has been a lack of delivery on any of these promises, huge staggering disparity. I mean, a lot of the talk is around vaccines, but from the very beginning for even other medical products that might be needed to contain the pandemic, we saw that a lot of the supplies uh, globally, limited supply were all snapped up by the few developed countries. Developed countries represent 16% of the world population, by the way. Uh, whereas the rest of the world, and especially the lower income countries, really struggled to gain access. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for this is, you know, that we have allowed, in a global pandemic, we are continuing to allow production and supply to be dictated by business as usual, profit-making industry approaches, and failing to leverage global production capacity and global needs. So where, you know, they have said, oh, there are a lot of manufacturing agreements, there are voluntary licenses, but if you look at the nitty gritty details, um, the agreements that exist mostly are contract manufacturing. Uh, that means to say the uh, big manufacturers continue to, uh, big pharma continues to dictate uh, who is supplied, where it's produced, the price of it, um, and essentially creating arti artificial scarcity so that they can continue to maximize profits. And we see that um, even some of the licenses, the narrative is these licenses are open to all manufacturers. But in reality, if you look at the terms of the uh, agreement, they are going to be given to a select group of manufacturers. And these manufacturers are not really coming from uh, Africa region. 
Uh, in fact, it is really a small group of manufacturers that in the end dominate the supply market. And so we have been promised collaboration um, and we have not received that. Uh, recently, WHO Independent Panel on Pandemic Response and Preparedness said that the promise of collaboration has not materialized and we are now almost the end of second year into the uh, pandemic. So when we talk of equitable access, there are two elements. One is availability, another one is affordability. And if we are looking at the scale of the challenge before us, uh, you know, not only will we need to vaccinate, we might need boosters, uh, we will need we do not know, maybe annual vaccination. We also do not know what we do not know, right? This is the nature of the current pandemic. Um, and so what we really need to do is to really scale up global manufacturing, diversify supply. And this is a huge part of uh, decolonizing global public health, where developing countries can manufacture for their own needs. Different regions can manufacture for their own needs. So it's about diversifying supply. Currently supply is very concentrated in a few countries and we need to diversify this global manufacturing not just for this pandemic but also for future crises uh, what we are what we are facing currently is really uh, a very strong indication of what challenges we are going to face in the future unless we actually try and diversify production so this brings us to the question of intellectual property uh, and when we talk of intellectual property, the common uh, understanding of intellectual property is patents, but it's not just patents. You have got issues around trade secrets, industrial designs, copyrights. These are all different categories of intellectual property. And depending on what you're trying to manufacture, um, they can hinder production, supply and access in different ways. Each of these intellectual property grant varying levels of monopolies to the right holder. So if you take, for instance, mRNA vaccine, the pattern landscape is quite complex. So you will have the manufacturing methods and techniques protected by a uh, trade secret. You parts of the mRNA vaccines. Uh, we see even uh, companies like Moderna, they, they may not, they do not seem to hold the entire inter patents um, landscape over their technology because the lipid technology is uh, licensed from another biotech company. So the, the pattern landscape is rather complex. And this is why in October 2020, we had India and South Africa present a joint proposal to waive specific provisions of the WTO agreement on intellectual property. This international agreement sets the minimum binding standards on intellectual property. And this proposal is currently co-sponsored by 64 countries and supported by the majority of the membership. We have, for instance, the entire Africa group uh, membership in WTO supporting this uh, proposal. And it has received global uh, support. Now, the proposed waiver is limited to COVID-19. So the waiver is really about waiving international obligations to protect intellectual property monopolies. And, you know, uh, it's about waiving this right so that we can do what is necessary. We can get other manufacturers, follow-on manufacturers to enter the market. Just to mention that the granting of a waiver is not a new thing. Uh, there are many precedents in WTO whereby waivers have been granted often to developed countries uh, um, and these waivers include waiver from IP provisions. So there are very different kinds of waivers over different trade obligations and there have been in the past waivers of certain IP obligations as well because there's a very concrete legal basis for this in the WTO where it says that waivers from WTO obligations are allowed under exceptional circumstances. Now, why is it very important? Because WTO has something called the dispute settlement mechanism, which allows for state to state dispute settlement, and hence the call for a waiver from this um, agreement, the obligations on IP in this agreement. Now, the main idea of the waiver is really to create policy space for developing con for countries, generally WTO members, to create the policy space for them to do what is necessary at the national level to make it easier to address intellectual property challenges. It's about creating the freedom to operate for manufacturers because if there's something protected by a right holder, another manufacturer cannot enter the market to the extent that, uh, you know, there's a patent that has been granted. Sometimes the, I, if there's only a patent application and a patent has not been granted, that in itself can create a chilling effect. So the idea is to simplify how we address intellectual property barriers the idea is to create um, 
a space for greater collaboration with respect to development and production, uh, and to create the economies of scale. Uh, because normally production, if you want to reduce the cost of production, you need to have economies of scale. The, the, intellect, the WTO uh, IP agreement, which is known as the TRIPS agreement, also has certain flexibilities, policy options available, such as compulsory license to override the patent barrier. But the problem is when we're dealing with a pandemic of this scale, uh, you, you know, you want to reduce the kind of measures the government need to take, you know, to simplify it. Uh, the way that uh, the, the whole compulsory license system is actually set up, that will create a, uh, a barrier uh, for entering the market much easier. And it normally has to be done, it would normally, it would need to be done normally product by product and country by country. Now this proposal, although it has received global support, uh, and the support of the majority of WTO members, it's actually opposed by a handful of developed countries, in particular the EU, UK and Switzerland. There were other developed countries, but I think the civil society in campaigning has really had a good effect uh, in, in uh, getting the support of some of the other developed countries. Uh, but what we see is EU in particular continues to oppose, they continue to disrupt uh, and have taken a, quite an obstructionist approach uh, in the WTO. Uh, they refuse to engage with good faith with the, pro the text that has been put forward. And this is despite the fact that the European Parliament itself have taken a decision to uh, call on the EU to engage in tax-based negotiation have actually, and have actually supported a, a temporary waiver from WTO TRIPS obligations. The US at the political level has supported the TRIPS waiver proposal. Uh, although they have limited it to vaccines, but this does not go far enough, um, you know, uh, at, the tech, at the technical level, we have not seen much engagement. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is this, if you look at the history of intellectual property, the history of the intellectual property, these rules were actually the result of lobbying efforts by intellectual property associations and multinational companies at that time, in 1995, before 1995, and specifically Pfizer, because before the WTO TRIPS agreement, there were no such globalized intellectual property rules. A lot of countries actually did exclude pharmaceutical products from their uh, national uh, patent laws. Um, and there weren't such, uh, how do you say, rigid globalized intellectual property rules. And a lot of the pharmaceutical industries that have come up in developing countries have come up in the absence of um, these rules. In fact, it is recognized, if you look at the history of how technology is developed, it is actually has happened uh, in the absence of intellect, such strong intellectual property rules. The intellectual property rules benefit countries once you have a certain level of technological development. Uh, so the, the, the lobbying efforts of you know, um, the developed country industries and in in particular, the pharmaceutical sector and Pfizer specifically is actually the is what we have has led to the WTO TRIPS agreement. And at that time in 1995, most developing countries were not really aware of the impact of these rules. Uh, they, they were not, I would say, not even most likely in the room when this were being negotiated. Um, and, you know, a lot of promises at that time were made, for instance, in the area of agriculture, in technology transfer, none of this actually we have seen materialize now more than 20 years after the WTO uh, TRIPS agreement. Now, following the WTO TRIPS agreement, as we all woke up to the impact of what has been adopted, developing countries tried to use the flexibility, such as compulsory licensing, but even in using these flexibilities, and these are legal rights we have under the TRIPS agreement, what we faced was immense pressure on us not to do so. Uh, you know, uh, in, in 2001, uh, when South Africa tried to use flexibilities, you know, they came under, they were being sued by multinational companies in South Africa. Uh, this led to the Doha Declaration on TRIPS and Public Health. Uh, Brazil, more recently, Malaysia also used compulsory license to import more affordable hepatitis C medicines. They came under immense pressure, not just from the pharmaceutical sector, but also from the developed countries. So developed countries have dis discouraged developing countries from using these flexibilities. Now, when developing countries are saying, look, we are in a global pandemic, we really need to 
uh, you know, waive these intellectual property rules so that we can all collaborate and enter the market easily. They're saying, no, but you have flexibilities. But then they have discouraged us from using it for uh, more than two decades. So this is where we are with respect to the TRIPS waiver. And I think the TRIPS waiver is a very important tool for uh, empowering governments to take action towards equitable access. And we should, if it's adopted, uh, it should actually extend to products and technologies needed to control the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sanjita. I think um, you explained something that can be very technical and that has been, um, I think, um, really morphed in the public. I explained it very well to what's actually happening um, when it comes to inequity, um, as well as, you know, the the failure of uh, our leaders to leverage global production capacity. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and so we are now ready to do the Q and A. Osman, I saw that you unmuted. Did you want to say anything, or you just? No, no. Just, just, just to just to add that all these presentations have been music to my ears, and uh, I, you know we've written quite a bit about uh, the last presentation, this, the, the stuff on IP. And, uh, really good to hear people talking uh, about these issues. So please, the Q&A, cozy. Yeah, sure, no worries. Yeah, it's been super enlightening. Okay, I'm going to start. Well, thank you everyone who have submitted questions. Uh, so we're gonna start with the question to uh, Dr. Michelle Khan. The question is, how can amateur and emerging scholars uh, pave our way to be heard and seen? Um, and I think this is from Bima Tapa, and uh, he or she also says that from coming from an Asian country with an indigenous background, I see a lot of great opportunities um, or fellowships dedicated to most of the developed country scholars. So over to you, uh, Dr. Michelle, to answer that question. Sure, thanks. And thanks for the, I guess, thanks for the nice feedback. It's, it's I suppose, one of the things we, we can do is start to get people to question um, assumptions. Uh, and I think I want to maybe reflect a little bit on what um, you know, Dr. Sam um, Oti also said. I think the first step is to decide whether one um, or, or be aware that speaking out of these issues about these issues will come at some price. Um, but I would still highly um, encourage it. But uh, you know, I think for emerging scholars, that is something to be aware of. Um, so naturally, one I think one can write about it and speak about it. There's I think increasing platforms. Um, and in some of the global health journals that are asking for new voices to share that some simple experiences aren't as um, open and not open to the people that they should be open to. I'm just, am I losing connection? Sorry. So, um, yeah, I think so yeah, we, I, hope... we, I missed a bit of that, but you can maybe try to do it again if it's okay. Yeah, no, sorry. I was saying that I, I, I do recognize that a lot of the fellowships aren't open to the, the exact people that they should be. Um, and I know that's something that's difficult for emerging scholars to, sh to change, but I hope that collectively a lot of us will be, will be lobbying um, for more opportunities for, for emerging scholars. Thank you, Michelle. Um, on to the next question. I think that was a, a great answer about, well, just wanted to comment about, yeah, definitely um, being aware of what stage you are in and what Dr. Oti said about it's, we're stronger together. <laughs> it's, it can be very difficult for individuals to really expose themselves um, and speak up, even though if you can, you should, but I think, you know, as a, as an early scholar, it's important to work together with other folks as well. I'll just add that. Um, okay, so the next question, I'm going to pose this to uh, Dr. Oti as well as Dr. Fala. Um, it says that Africa has more than 25% of the global burden of disease, but around 3% of the global health workforce. How can or should the global health network support rebalancing capacity building and expertise where it is most needed? And is there a role for exchange and mutual benefit, which may involve better resource rich country institutions and communities? Over to you all. Dr. Oti, can you start? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, no, I think the, the issue of capacity building is one that <clears throat> in many ways is a is a bit of is a, a bit of a black box, right? 
So on one hand, you know, you, you want to ensure that you create opportunities for the next pipeline of global health practitioners to, you know, get the, the skills that they need. Um, and then you also recognize that even though they are great academic uh, institutions, they are great capacity building uh, training opportunities uh, across uh, the continent, there are also gaps, right? There are also quite a number of gaps. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll give a very uh, specific example. Let's, let's talk about something like just getting a basic master's in public health. And I know at least two of my former colleagues um, who at the time were pursuing their masters at local institutions here on the continent. And it was getting to almost taking them as long as doing a PhD to just complete those uh, uh, MPH programs. And it, it was just a, a whole variety of issues like strikes, uh, conflicts between multiple supervisors, etc. Um, and then some of them had to just quit and then rule either in Europe or uh, in, in, in North America and literally abandon their, their master's programs uh, here halfway. And, and that's not to say that that's the, that's the broad situation, uh, but, the, but, but that's a, a reality, especially for people pursuing PhDs. That is also a very big issue. It could take you, the, the level of unpredictability is, is just so high. So what a number of institutions on the continent that I know have done is to sort of, uh, you know, mobilize funding that sort of enables people, uh, um, people who are enrolled in some of these programs to sort of bypass, you know, all the politics and uh, all the, the, the institutional constraints that exist in the institutions where they are at. Uh, for example, there's this initiative uh, that was known as the African Doctoral Dissertation Research Fellowship. And what that did was that for people who are within two years of, uh, well, who are at least two years into their PhD and all that is left is for them to, you know, work on their thesis, uh, they would get a, a significant amount of funding to sort of block off time to focus on the PhD, to buy away time from, from, their, from their institutions and then just focus on, on, on their work, but also to support them with uh, additional um, coursework, which they might not be able to access at their uh, respective uh, institutions. So I think, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we need a mix of, of approaches uh, but we need to ensure that those approaches are happening in developing countries in, you know, because this whole idea of having to go outside of, the, of your country or having to leave your continent, having to leave your region for, your, for you to sort of be validated, right, by, uh, to, to get a degree that is, that is recognized, for example, to get your capacity built in a manner that is recognized uh, internationally, I think that puts us at a disadvantage. How many people can afford or how many people will ever get access to scholarships to go abroad? I mean, if you do that well and good and, and I have no issue with that, but then we have to continuously explore uh, opportunities to ensure that do, the capacity is built in the ground, on the ground, in the continents where we live, uh, and that those and that we respect those uh, those credentials uh, that that we we support. Um, but there's also a program that I want to mention before I hand over to to Dr. Fala, and I think uh, some of you might have heard about it, and it's called the Science Granting Councils Initiative. Uh, and that's a partnership be between the organization I work for, the International Development Research Center, and a whole, uh, whole host of funders. And what they're doing is that rather than having the traditional model of you know, funding going from a funder, uh, maybe through a competitive call that might not you know, put you know, uh, institutions from uh, developing countries at a disadvantage as we have seen so often in the past, they channel those funds through national science granting councils, for example, NACOSTI, uh, in Kenya or the South Africa Medical Research Council uh, in, in South Africa. And through uh, that kind of partnership, I, I believe that it's sort of, it, it, those kind of partnerships shift the power imbalances and empower these national uh, agencies, science granting agencies, for example, to now you know, support work that could now include uh, uh, capacity building of, of, of researchers and, and of other practitioners, not just in global health, but in the development space more broadly. 
Thank you. Um, over to you, uh, Masako, but I was going to also ask if maybe you can also address the question in the chat about um, health sector spending. Um, um, yeah, a colleague wrote that don't we, we need to look into respective countries reevaluating their health, health sector spending. So maybe you can add that on if you would like. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, how do we build capacity? I think every time there is an epidemic or pandemic and we respond, we should use it to build better, build back better. Having some dedicated funding to create a mechanism that can build the next generation of, uh, of, 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 of scientists or respondents. Every time there's an outbreak, outbreak we start providing opportunity for research, provide opportunity for learning. So consolidating those kind of knowledge and building training institutions centered around those outbreaks. I do know that the Africa Free Epidemiology Program has, with funding from the World Bank, has provided the basic, intermediate, and advanced at certain centers across Africa, and that has been used. So uh, using outbreak funding as in part of the recovery to build back better, you know, build institution better. For example, Liberia and Sierra Leone, who have a center for learning that will train the local, because what happened in outbreak, we, we, we recruit a lot of people and we given the practical training. Also developing hybrid program, you know, like uh, we are working on a project with Karolinska Institute where we have PhD students who will go six weeks in every year to Karolinska and come back home and do their research. And then there, there are African uh, mentors and European mentors like that help to, to build collaboration and partnership. And, and, and also we do, we do know that eventually we need to build institutions that can offer masters and PhD. And that would mean a selected few Africans are able to be trained to become independent scientists. Just having a PhD isn't enough, but training them, giving them seed money, giving the academic ladder in the institutions. And we do know, I know for sure for Liberia, for instance, at the end of the Ebola, because of the forecast that were done, they were pretty close to the medical school, but Using, as, using these responses as a way to build an institution and going more regional would be a, a, a way to go. The reason uh, to, uh, regional is better in terms of Africa is the expertise may not all be concentrated in one country, but you can pull expertise and, 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 and pull research collaborators and, and pull uh, research advisors across different institutions. Uh, I will have to give the EDCTP uh, grant at least starting goodwill. is allow you to have 25 percent and indirect costs, picking consortium, and north soft collaboration to build future uh, expert. Because once you build a pool of independent scientists and professors, you can have a program to train others in the country effectively. Uh, that's one. Healthcare. Dr. Fala, I think you're going in and out. I I'm from my side, at least. I'm not hearing you at the moment. Yeah. Okay, I think we're having some network issues. So if it's okay, I'm gonna move on to um, Dr. Oswaldo. Maybe you could answer the question um, about um, reevaluating health sector spending. Most cases is donor dependent. I mean, you talked about um, you know capitalism and how that is a tool of modernity and it, how it is a, a colonial tool as well. Um, I don't know if this, if somehow you can feed into this as well. Uh, uh, sorry, Negosi, I, I have difficulty to to hear you. Could okay. you repeat, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so there's a question in the, the chat that asks about looking at respective countries reevaluating their health sector spending, um, which in many cases donor dependent. Um, and it, it talks about, um, you know, looking at uh, health solely as a social sector could be the cause for neglect of countries reevaluating and investing in their health um, as an econo economic sector. So I was just remembering what you said about capitalism and wondering if you could feed into this question. Um, yes, um, well, I, I'm not sure how, how we can uh, proceed with uh, these constraints, but um, perhaps uh, something to look is that um, countries uh, have uh, a spending capacity, uh, at, at least here in Brazil and, and some 
especially in Brazil, but uh, also in other uh, Latin American countries, there's uh, an spending capacity to uh, invest in, in health services, for instance. So uh, I think that uh, I'm trying to link with uh, the talk of Sangeeta, this uh, capacity uh, can be used to invest in what uh, the, the countries uh, need uh, to evaluate what the countries need and in this way to try to, to build a, an autonomy for research and, and development. Uh, I think that this is a, a, a gradual uh, process because uh, as I said, uh, uh, it is uh, very difficult to think in something totally uh, colonial or something totally uh, decolonial. And in our countries in the global South, when we try to, to, to resist or to build uh, alternatives, we must to realize that we are uh, in, a, in a global, uh, in a colonial setting, uh, and we need to work with that. So uh, I, I have no uh, uh, um, a categorical answer to that. I, I think we, we, we can uh, explore that kind of, of alternatives, uh, but, but I, I don't really know how exactly we can uh, go out of uh, that track. Oh no, thank you very much. I think your point about it being a gradual process and how it's very difficult to reimagine when you're already living in the world constructed the way that it is, I think it's a very important point. Um, we have, so thank you. We have one more minute in this session. Um, I don't know if I have, there's quite a few questions about um, vaccines and Pfizer's in the chat. Um, do I have a minute to ask the question, Osman? Yeah, I, I think so, Ngozi. Go ahead, because we're going to go straight into a panel discussion with the panelists anyway, so it's okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So there's a few questions, but I'm going to ask about two of them. And um, uh, Sanjita, I hope you can just answer those if that's okay. So one is um, from Sama who asked, why is Pfizer leading the way to fill and finish vaccine manufacturing in Africa? We need to do joint R&D and this means sustainable impactful collaboration. Um, and then one is from uh, Julie. Um, I think Julie had a similar question about like uh, Pfizer Biotech involved in mRNA tech hub, but then she also asked, um, what is your opinion is there a problem in the distribution cold chain skeptical atti attitude due to formal illegal unserious testing? Um, and I think she's she's um, asking that into, in regards to what degree um, is Pfizer being involved in a hub? How would that um, how would that endanger their patent? Or yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I hope that makes sense. But, yeah. Over. Hi. Thank, thanks very much for the question. Um, so what we see is Pfizer is not interested in doing any kind of licensing. Their main focus is to do contract manufacturing, um, where they control basically the production, the supply, um, and the pricing. I think there was a announcement about a fill and finish agreement that they would do with in South Africa. I, I do not have the full details. I do not know how far it has gone. But there as well, if it's fill and finish, then um, the control over the substance would come from Pfizer. And I think Pfizer would essentially have quite a bit of control over the entire production and where it's applied and the prices. So the problem here is the control that uh, the right holders have over production. Uh, and we have not seen Pfizer willing to do any kind of licensing that will take away that that where they will have to share that control, they will give away that control. And that is why from our perspective, uh, the TRIPS waiver uh, discussion is very, very important because it highlights the need to diversify supply. It has highlighted the fact that a lot of the promises around collaboration have really not come through. Uh, and so what we then need is for governments to step in to have the right tools uh, with them. And here the TRIPS waiver would then create that policy space um, greater flexibility for governments at the national level to address the intellectual property barrier. Uh, that would include patents as well. Uh, otherwise, there are policy options right now in the international agreement. 
but it will take time to you know implement it's you know you'll have to do it product by product yeah there is a lot of pressure and there has historically been pressure not to use any of these uh, policy options so uh, this is why there is the call for the waiver yeah thanks sanjita and um, thanks to all the speakers for your interventions today and answering the questions. I, I won't go too long, but just to say, um, what I'm leaving with is if you're in the UK or the EU, um, you know, Sanjita said how effective civil society has been um, in so many other developed countries regarding um, supporting the TRIPS waiver. So um, I would say, please get involved in um, pushing your governments to do so. And over to you. So thank you speakers and over to you, Osman. <coughs> So, 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 thank you, everyone, for 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 your for your great questions and to all the speakers and uh, for, for great presentations and to Ngozi for doing such an excellent job with sharing and keeping us to time. Most importantly, uh, I'm always terrible at keeping us to time, but I but I think we what we wanted to do now is uh, turn this into a bit of a panel discussion, uh, and I'm and I think we haven't been provocative enough to be to be to be honest. We're, we we we've, we've said some things. But we haven't been provocative enough, so so let's take this up a notch uh, a little bit. You know, I, I, we we really want this to be a lively debate. So this is the this is the opportunity, I suppose, to 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 let rip, but I think in a constructive way. Um, so let's let's think about how we can um, uh, how we can come at this. Um, Perhaps one thing I'd I'd like to get a sense from the from the from the panelists, and and this is open to any of the panelists. Um, when you when we talk about decolonizing global global health, um, in a sense, where where there's an assumption that we're living in a post-colonial world in the first place, and and is that is that really the case? Uh, are how many of the countries in the global south are truly independent or sovereign uh, in the in, in the first place, if you, if we take, um, you know, we just let's 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 take let's take Africa and the and the ex uh, French colonies that still use the CFA franc, okay, just as an example, uh, these countries have to keep more than fifty percent of their foreign reserves with the French central bank. You have a French central banker in in every country's um, central bank committee setting uh, monetary policy setting. Of, uh, fiscal and tax policy. Um, are these truly sovereign or independent countries in the first place? Can we even have a conversation about decolonizing global health if the countries themselves are not independent? I'm just going to open that up uh, and just invite some input from our panelists. And and, and uh, perhaps yeah, if, if you want to speak on the on 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 the point I've raised, then just raise your hand. So, Doctor. Perhaps we'll start with Dr. Fala and uh, and then and then and then Sam. Hello, you raise a very good point. So there are two issues here. Uh, a friend of ours at the airport in uh, Kigali yesterday, as we were aboard the plane, we were discussing two neocolonialism. You know, what the control of our minds, such that we feel incapable as African. Uh, everything that is from the West is better because a little discussion basically. We have some funding, huge sum of funding. And I was telling my colleagues, a couple of countries, how can we fund uh, industries to manufacture masks and manufacture hand sanitizer? We get so much more. Sorry, Dr. Fala, I think we, we, we've lost your connection a little bit. Could you try and repeat that? from our partnership with MasterCard. Basically, I said yesterday we were discussing a colleague about, and I, about the issue of the new colonialism agenda that has to do with our minds, our inability to think that we yeah. African, we can do it and can do better. And I was illustrating that I was leading a discussion with 14 member states, asking them we have some funding to support the rollout of COVID vaccines. How can we build industries in Africa to manufacture gloves and hand sanitizer instead of inputting it. I was starting to know that most of my colleagues were giving all, all the reasons we can do it. We'll be out competed by the North. We don't have raw material to produce masks. I was telling them we have funding for 900 million people to provide masks. So the new colonialism agenda is in our heads. 
That's, that's the first part. All the best institutions in the West, when you come from an institution in the, from the global South, no matter how brilliant you are, no matter how populous you are, you are not respected. So the, the, that is one, but also on the example of France, France are in show that countries and leaders that try to raise consciousness are brought down to their needs. You know this, the history is, the history is there. I'm a secretary. When the French were leaving Guinea, they pulled down to the electric wiring. Uh, uh, Togo, he was overthrown because he stood up to them. Thomas Sankara, when he said, let's start paying back the debt, let's manufacture. So what France has succeeded in doing is that all of those that try to be outliers have ended terribly. And so they have created a culture of fear. So that's exactly the point. Countries and leaders that have become reforming their thinking and is asking, let's go away from these colonial masters from saving our camps and let's send our own have been assassinated. You and I know the, the reality of the matter across. So um, the others have shrink in fear. So there's an issue of the neocolonialism and the fear. And so those two tension is still pushing us. How do we You can okay. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, no, uh, but uh, I mean, I agree with everything you're saying, Dr. Mosoka. Mosoka um, but I think the first thing is for us to then, as a, as a community, be conscious uh, of that history and background, and, and perhaps not enough of us are. Um, so uh, anyone else would like, uh, like to comment on that point, or um, can, I raise a, can I raise another issue? Okay, well, um, in the in the chat, uh, uh, Professor Richard Koch talks about um, extending the discussion to One Health um, and and talking about perhaps the colonial legacy around uh, developing agricultural systems. You know, using the colonies um, as a means of extraction of, of exploiting the resources of these lands um, and how that has led to uh, both continuing inequity, uh, but also importantly. Uh, poor health in the colonies, the spillover and emergence of diseases. Um, what, mo what more needs to be done in this space? Um, are, are we having enough of a discussion in, in this around the exploitative legacy um, around, uh, uh, around colonization and, and how that hasn't had an impact on both health within the, within the colonies or the ex-colonies, um, as well as the emergence of uh, disease? And, and perhaps we can hear from Oswaldo and Michal on this, um, as you both sort of worked in the One Health space. Um, yes, uh, I, I think we can uh, follow with what um, Dr. Mosoko just said, uh, because it is uh, quite important to realize that uh, the colonizing health is not a, an independent issue. To think about the colonizing health, we necessarily need to decolonize our minds, decolonize our bodies, because health is part of all of that. And uh, in the exercise of uh, decolonization, uh, I, one thing that, that we can uh, think about uh, one health is that uh, animalization is a uh, marginalizing uh, apparatus. And we uh, put uh, other species just as resources. So uh, the, the, the exercise of decolonization uh, also include thinking differently about uh, other beings and about the meaning of uh, the environment. And once uh, we realize that it is not a universal law dictating that we have uh, other species or uh, the environment to uh, use uh, as we please, we begin to uh, uh, build other relationships with uh, those uh, assemblages in which uh, we are uh, immersed. And the, the comment is, uh, I, I agree with uh, the, the points 
bring by it because uh, yes, when, when, when we uh, see one health as uh, some uh, something different, we can uh, begin to think about techno fixes and uh, epidemiological studies to identify risk factors and, and things like that. But uh, it, it's it's very difficult to see within one health approaches uh, addressing what we are uh, talking about here and uh, and trying to to continue us with with the conversation and with the comment about uh, uh, food industries uh, and uh, environmental impacts uh, here in in Brazil there's a uh, interesting uh, things happening in uh, the context of agroecology of uh, indigenous peoples and small farmers uh, organizing and created networks with uh, urban settings uh, to, to, to create uh, alternative uh, sources of food uh, which is not only a, a, a product that is uh, uh, circulating, but uh, with that, we also have another rationality uh, about the meaning of food, not just a commodity, but food uh, and the health implied by that, not just the health for the consumer, but the health of, of all that assemblage. Yeah. And, uh, so and, 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 one final comment, uh, that comment that I, I want to, to, to do is that, uh, yes, it's, we, we have a, a lot of ideas. We, we know uh, where we want to, to go, but we have the difficulty to, to go there. And uh, perhaps, uh, and it, it's uh, some, some uh, difficult uh, idea, Philanthrocapitalism is one of those alternatives, because mm. yes, uh, we know philanthrocapitalism is, is a tool to legitimize and to reinforce uh, coloniality uh, and, yeah. and inequity. But at the same time, philanthrocapitalism uh, give resources, give possibilities uh, of condition to do things differently. So yeah. uh, uh, that, that, that's my, my, my final comment to try to think in building uh, alternatives which go through uh, the colonizing mind, bodies, and to realize that uh, colonialism and philanthrocapitalism uh, is a reality yeah. that we must do, to put into the equation. So, so I am going to thank you for touching on that as well. Although I am going to bring in this issue of philanthro capitalism uh, into the discussion, uh, you, you you stole my thunder a little bit there, but uh, but uh, I, I'll, I'll introduce that in in a minute. But let, let's just go over to Michelle. Michelle, how do we decolonize One Health? Uh, and and then over to Sangeeta because I see she's got her hand raised and she was talking about the technology transfer in the agriculture sector and some of those issues. So perhaps we can hear from her as well. So Michelle, first over to you. Yeah, so okay, um, I'll, I'll be quick. I think one of the parallels I wanted to draw with some of the challenges that are, you know, just irrespective of decolonization within the One Health space um, and making even One Health not as work as effectively as it could is this idea of sort of intellectual superiority, like, you know, sort of the human health versus the animal health. And that's something that I think is a core theme that, that resonates even with this what we're talking about decolonization, this idea of certain people's expertise being more valuable than others, sort of the quantitative over lived experiences. So I would just say that's something that I think we need to, you know, that's sort of like an evil, I think, that needs to be rooted out or at least challenged across many lines of thinking, because it makes us less effective as, as listening to each other and learning from each other and prejudices come in. So I know it's not a solution, but I think there's a lot of um, parallels there and, and things that will make the One Health movement more effective will also be the same things that make um, the decolonizing space move um, more quickly. And and do you think that there's more, I mean, I don't know what the sense is, but do you think there's a profit incentive uh, around uh, these the, the other sectors, the animal agriculture sector, the environmental sector, than, than perhaps 
in human health, a lot, a lot of things within the human health. So if we take human health as an industry, is there, is there, is there perhaps less of, a, is it more altruistic? Is there less of a profit motive in that, or is, uh, or is that not the case? I think it would be it would be difficult to say that there's not a huge profit motive when, when we're seeing what's happening with sort of vaccine inequity, you know. Um, so so yeah, I think you know both profits uh, as well as just positions of power. It's sometimes it's not money that's driving people uh, to try and uh, keep themselves as as the the main experts and keep other people being represented as being sort of peripheral. It's it's also it's also you know it's great to be the ones in the limelight and and holding the space. So, so I think that that continues to be kind of a human nature challenge that we need to overcome. Yeah, so many of these challenges are stemming from human nature. Uh, Sangeeta, perhaps we could hear from you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to touch on the point that often national policy making, national action is dependent on international rules. Uh, and we need to ensure, so it's, it, it's the discussion we're happening, uh, having on, you know, what's happening, the political will at the national level, you know, how we think about, uh, you know, our position, developing countries' position, you know, in global health, individually, all of that is, it's, I think these are very good issues, but also to recognize that what happens at the national level is often in, influenced by international rules. So we spoke a lot about the international rules on intellectual property, but it's not just what is happening in WTO, but also what's happening in WHO. So a lot of the discussion around One Health, for instance, uh, would be happening in OIE as well as in the WHO. And how these rules are crafted would really greatly then um, confer what kind of rights governments have, what kind of policy space they have, and whether there's equity. Uh, and I wanted to flag that one very important discussion that is happening at the international level in the World Health Organization is around the sharing of biological materials and sequence information. Uh, and as we know, uh, a lot of the development of diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, uh, requires access to these biological materials and sequence information. But what we see at the international level that is that the sharing is quite one way where there is an expectation that, you know, we are going to be sharing freely and we should share because it's a public health issue. But the problem is that it's happening in the absence of a regulated framework. It's happening in the absence of recognition that, you know, there should be also fair and equitable benefit sharing. And I wanted to just also highlight that these are rights that governments have under the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocol on access and benefit sharing that say that access to biological resources, because biological resources are actually the rights of sovereign states, uh, and any access should be subject to fair and equitable benefit sharing. And what we have seen in WHO, actually there is a very strong precedent in how we do deal with pandemic flu viruses, where there is something called the pandemic influenza preparedness framework, which tries to set up this entire more equitable system. It, it's not a perfect system, definitely, but it tries to create more, brings in more equity uh, because in, when we de dealt with H5N1 as well, we had a similar problem where um, there was sharing of samples, vaccines were there, but vaccines were being hoarded by developed countries. You know, countries in Southeast Asia could not get access. And, 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 you know, this, and at one point, Indonesia just said, look, we are just going to stop sharing because we don't see an equitable framework set up. So I just want to point that, you know, we have to be involved in discussions at the international level. Uh, developing countries, uh, African nations, uh, you know, need to set out their, their concrete positions. And, you know, if we don't do this, then the inequity also starts from all these different international rules. Uh, and we, are fi we find ourselves, you know, taking on obligations without any kind of rights. So I just wanted so to point just, Yeah, so, so Sangeeta, thanks for raising that, because I just wanted to pick up on some of those points uh, with you in particular, and then, you know, open it to others as well. Uh, of course, the big trigger for uh, the pandemic influenza preparedness framework was Indonesia's refusal to share uh, H5N1 samples because they were the, because they were being charged for the you know the, the therapeutics that then ensue the vaccines the diagnostics uh, they weren't there's, there's this whole issue around uh, sharing samples but then yes who benefits from the commercial and academic benefits that then ensue who 
who shares that, who has sovereignty over those issues. So the stage in this pandemic, two years in, where countries in the global south, say say, say the, the Southern African states that have uh, been unfairly targeted uh, with, you know, uh, trade and transport boycotts and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, are we at a stage where countries should be getting together and saying we're not going to share samples if we don't get access to the requisite technologies uh, across the spectrum of uh, COVID-19 medical countermeasures? Because it's not just vaccines, it's the diagnostics technology, it's the therapeutics, the monoclonal antibodies, which are starting to, you know, we're starting to see some that have some limited efficacy. If you've got a loved one in a hospital in South Africa, why should they not have uh, access to a medical uh, countermeasure like a monoclonal antibody? You're going to throw everything you have at it at, at, the, at that situation. So are we at that stage? Has enough happened? Is there enough water under the bridge for countries to come together and say, we're not going to share samples if, you don't, if, if, if this technology isn't shared? I think we are at the stage where we need to insist that there is a framework uh, for addressing uh, fine approval benefit sharing. Uh, and they need to raise these voices much louder. I think we have not heard much around on this topic, uh, you know, but we have a very strong precedent in WHO. Uh, what I can say is, um, I don't know how, how many of you all follow the international health discussions happening. The US has recently uh, put in a proposal to amend the international health regulation, which is an internationally binding instrument, which calls for the sharing of genetic sequence data. Uh, but then, you know, we don't see on the other side uh, any kind of fan equitable benefit sharing, right? So if we want to have a system, and, and from public health perspective, we want to have a system that works for everyone, uh, then we must have a system that takes into account the need for a very, to concretize fan equitable benefit sharing. What does that mean in practice, you know, with respect to uh, licensing, with respect to access to technologies, with respect to cell lines that we need to develop our vaccines, you know, uh, with respect to affordable pricing uh, and, and ensuring that there is sufficient allocation for the, uh, the rest of the world in, and not just for the 16% of the world population. So I think this is a, an important discussion we need to have uh, in the w, uh, WHO. We need to concretize the benefit sharing. Thank you, Sangeeta. Uh, do any of our other uh, panelists want to come in on this point? Is it time to play hardball with the rest of the world? Oh, oh Osman, I, I completely agree with Sangeeta and we, we must invest with force in uh, international regulation negotiations in, in that domain. But uh, at the same time, we must see that this is an apparatus to maintain, to legitimize the uh, coloniality. So uh, we, we cannot uh, depend only on that. We must work in, the, in those negotiations, but we also need to realize uh, about our uh, relative autonomy to, uh, begin, to simultaneously do the things differently. So uh, it is in that uh, context that I mentioned uh, agroecology and again, the decolonization of our minds and, and our bodies, because otherwise we will uh, continue trapped in tools, in structures that mm -hmm. are designed to maintain the status quo. Yeah, so you're, so you're, so you're almost uh, questioning, you know, what, what the, ethical or moral framework is that within which we're operating and, and making the, the sorts of changes to that that are required. Um, uh, and that's, a, and that, that's of course, a much more profound uh, and deeper discussion, um, which we need to continue to have around the decolonizing movement. Um, I, I, I just wanted to uh, change tack a little bit to, to talk a little bit about this issue that uh, Oswaldo raised. Um, uh, he called it philanthro capitalism. Uh, but Sam, uh, perhaps we can turn to you. Oh, are there plenty of uh, of uh, African billionaires uh, and millionaires, and 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 why are they not allies with us in this decolonizing global health movement? Have we done enough to engage with those that are at least 
economically or financially empowered uh, within the global south to 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 create that environment of self-sufficiency and to move away from that dependency is enough being done you you, you spoke quite eloquently about um uh, uh people who benefit from uh, from these colonial structures, but also, you know, the local collaborators during slavery. And, uh, uh, and, and it reminded me of, uh, it reminded me of uh, a speech that Malcolm X gave, actually, where he compared, uh, he, he drew the distinction between what he what he referred to as sort of field Negroes and uh, 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 and how and house negroes and so so i just wanted to get your thoughts on that uh, uh can, can we not be relying on philanthropists from the global south to, to to sort of create these engines of change that that would be ideal right if if we had a critical mass of of uh, philanthropists in the global south i think it will it'll go a long way in sort of taking us on, on a path towards uh, rebalancing some of these uh, imbalances. Uh, but the issue is that I don't think we have enough of that. I, I don't even know if it's a cultural thing or if, if it's a, a historical thing in terms of where have a lot of our philanthropists made their money from? How have they, well, not, not say philanthropists, where have our rich people, let me put it that way, how have they made their wealth? Um, and I look at, uh, my, maybe I should talk about my country of origin, Nigeria, for example, where, you know, we, we, we often talk with pride about Dangote, who is the, the richest um, uh, man in Africa. And I have a, tr a tremendous respect for him. But his focus now, even though he has a foundation, the Dangote Foundation, I think his focus now is really on expanding economic opportunity for, for as, mo as many people as he can through, through his investments. And so I feel like things like these, you know, will be uh, the whole idea of decolonization will not be particularly uh, appealing to him. And so it leaves us in a situation where we don't have a critical mass of, of you know, should I call them local philanthropists who really care enough of such, you know, about such issues to, 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 to even want to support it. And so it leaves us vulnerable to this continuous, uh, continued um, um, influence of, of philanthropic capitalism, as, as, uh, as you have put it. But I think regardless, uh, and, and that's where I've been, you know, really uh, keen on mobilizing people to speak out. Um, because I think I'm already beginning, we're already beginning to see some changes from some of the traditional funders uh, of global health uh, in terms of being sensitive to some of these power uh, dynamics and even some of the language that I've seen coming out in, in some of the recent call for proposals, for example, I see that there's, there's, there's increasing uh, sensitivity because we have to just face it. Our own governments, for example, have not even lived up to their own commitments to, you know, to the healthcare sector. If we look at Africa, for example, we have the Abuja Declaration on Health where they by themselves, without anybody putting a gun to their heads, pledged 15% of their budgets to, to health. And that has, I think maybe one or two countries max have ever even gotten anywhere close uh, to that. Um, and so, so you, you literally don't have any hope in terms of expecting uh, that you know, local philanthropy or local uh, or public investments is going to come, is, you know, the levels of public investments are going to reach anywhere near for us to begin to get gain that uh, independence, right? And, and begin to challenge some of these power asymmetries. But I think I, I really admire what, for example, the Africa CDC uh, has been trying to do. And, and when, and when uh, Dr. Fala talked about the new public health order, I think it's something that we should all be proud of. And regardless of where you're from in the developing world, I think this is something we should all aspire uh, to, to, to support, because I think what they're trying to do is to, you know, set, set the terms and conditions for engagement, right? So it's not a, just a question of you coming with your funding and dictating how things go, but here are the rules of engagement. Treat us as equal, respect our local expertise, respect that we know what we are doing at the base, you know, at, at a fundamental level. And then we can begin to engage, even though you have the money and even though we have the need, 
that doesn't you know give you the right to treat us as as inferiors right and and, and, I, and I wish a lot of other institutions that at that level will begin to set those rules and conditions uh, for engagement because for now we still are heavily dependent on philanthropic capitalism that's just the reality of the situation but we can set the rules for engagement we, it just needs leadership and it needs courage the panelists uh okay so we've, we've talked about some you know practical perspective but to to end really what are the kinds of metrics we should be using to hold both ourselves um and and everyone else to uh to to account uh, around this uh, around monitoring or evaluating the progress we're making around decolonizing efforts uh, what are the kinds of metrics we need to be looking at uh, both at the sort of macro level but also at the programmatic level can can any of you think of how we might compartmentalize those anyone want to come in on that if i can speak a little bit from some of the innovations uh and apply by africa cdc so we have this uh, very extensive uh, partnership with mastercard foundation for um, COVID vaccine. It's a $1.5 billion investment. What the leadership at Africa CDC has deliberately done was to look at partners, look at implementing partners. And I think our director from his wisdom of working realized that some of the international partners will have an indirect cost of 60%. So what Africa has done deliberately has done is that almost 80% of the implementing partner are African-based organizations. Because one of the we want to measure is after this project, we want to see African nonprofit being much more powerful. So how do we um, elevate and empower them? That's what we are measuring it. Also, we've been able to negotiate the fact that most of these African NGOs will get 10% indirect cost, as opposed to 60, 70% if you brought Western uh, institution. We're trying to measure the impact, the regional impact. Most of these partners that have been brought have been recruited to influence uh, the West African region, Central African region. So how much impact they are going to make and how strong are we going to leave them after the project ends? And so that's one way that we're trying to now deliberately veer away from total dependence on Western nonprofit to help us implement what we need to do. And so Africans, it was, it was intentionally done where African and implement nonprofit were recruited, competitive process, and now they are onboarding or 18 of them have been brought in from Southern Africa to do research for vaccines. And so they're going to get better. So it's, a way to do that is that we're going to measure how better African NGOs get after this project and Mobisa, how much impact they make at a regional level. So that's that's one way we can begin to look at how the funds is optimized. Uh, and then also um, we've deliberately, obviously deliberately have chosen what we call the centers of excellence. In fact, the first meeting we held in Morocco, basically trying to help the African to know what is doable on the continent. 14 countries were taken to Morocco because Morocco has been able to do public-private partnership and vaccinate 80% of the population. And so the African countries were taken there and say, another African can do it, you can do it. We took 14 to Rwanda to see the fact that Rwanda could do 100% immunization in Kigali, see the, what is possible. So doing that kind of measure how much uh, community of practice we are building. So one of the things we continue to emphasize is community of practice. Building community of practice within the African region is one way to measure exactly metrics of how much we are de developing some ind independence too. Uh, working through local nonprofit and see how much impact they make and how internally transform they get to be able to uh, effect some of the things we have traditionally depended on the global north to do for us. And so this is the framework that has been developed within the Africa CDC context to really, really help us go towards that self-reliance, independence, and even with the partnership, how much of that partnership allow, how much decision within that partnership is allowed to the African continent. And so we see this happening within the framework of the new public health order. And we can measure how many of these countries are able to develop independence, how much of our continent grew nonprofit have become independent and more influential as a way of measuring our go towards uh, this uh, independence and trying to decolonize uh, the way we look at global health. 
Thanks, thanks, uh, Mosoka. Um, uh, so, so we we heard some some practical perspectives at the regional level. Uh, Sangeeta, you talked a little bit about uh, uh, you know how um, uh, at the global level, what 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 can be done because many of the issues that you talked about happen behind closed doors. The pressure that's brought to bear on countries around uh, um, uh, um, uh, around leveraging their rights to the TRIPS uh, agreement, for example, happen behind closed doors. If, if, uh, if I'm a small country and I just decide to try and, uh, you know, use my rights, uh, rights under TRIPS exemptions around a public health emergency, um, uh, bilaterally, you know, a powerful country could come along and say, okay, we're going to stop importing your fish or so something completely, you know, from, from, from a different sector uh, to bring pressure to bear uh, Omi, how, how can we bring some of those issues into the light? So how do you monitor and evaluate those kinds of uh, um, issues? Because not everything, obviously, that's, that, that's put in place to stop people using that dispute resolution mechanism at the WTO. So, so what can be done at the global level to bring some of these issues uh, in, to light? Um, well, I think the, the strength of developing countries at the international level comes in coalitions of developing countries. And I think, um, you know, having coalition of developing countries, South South cooperation, these are all very important uh, factors uh, for, for intervention uh, and to realize more equity. Um, and especially if you are a more smaller country, you know, I think having coalitions of developing country, like you have got Africa group that tends to negotiate mm. I mean, on some, not all issues, but in, on some issues like the TRIPS waiver, you know, so that gives a lot of weight. Uh, in the WTO, you have the LDC group. Um, in WHO, you've got different um, constellations of groupings, but, you know, it's along the similar lines. I think um, what helps a lot is to expose uh, some of, yeah. the, some of the, you know, some of the situations that we have seen with respect to uh, pressure put on countries. Um, uh, transparency is very important in this regard and to the extent that we can expose you know that that can play a very strong role uh, in supporting the countries you know in, in whatever they're trying to achieve yeah yeah and then that's and that's I suppose what we what we try to pro provide as a forum through you know uh, platforms like this is is having that forum for that, that kind of exposure for, for that kind of uh, conversation about transparency. So I just so we've come to the end of our time. I know there's lots more we could have talked about and a lot more that discussion to be had, but hopefully the co conversation uh, will continue. We heard some very powerful themes from all our speakers. Uh, I think central to breaking uh, the the uh, central to, to a lot of this was the was the power dynamics and justice angle that Michelle spoke about. Uh, Sam gave us a very impassioned. Uh, 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 call to arms almost around uh, getting groups together to collaborate uh, and support decolonization. Oswaldo talked very powerfully about the links to um, capitalism and exploitation of resources um, and how we need to perhaps reimagine or, or reframe our uh, moral and ethical value system um, if, we, if we want to really advance uh, uh, a decolonizing agenda. Um, and and Dr. Mosoka spoke very powerfully, I think. About. And um, outbreak response uh, environment is, is, is an industry. So, so you know, uh, the US pre President Dwight uh, President Eisenhower spoke about a military industrial complex, but equally there's a development industrial complex or a humanitarian response industrial complex. And, per and perhaps that's how we should be thinking about uh, these things, that these are actually industries and, uh, and, and, and who is benefiting from these industries and, and, and is there equitable sharing of the, of the profits and the, and, the, uh, and the material benefits of these. But at the same time, thinking about what Oswaldo was saying, perhaps all of this just needs to be reimagined and reframed around a sustainable moral and ethical framework. So, so there's a lot of uh, food for thought there. Um, and ultimately, it's about moving away from uh, dependency to self-sufficiency. 
uh, and promoting efforts uh, around all of that. So I just want to thank again all our speakers and all the excellent questions that we had coming in and to thank my co-chair, um, Gozi. Gozi, perhaps we can give you the last word, uh, just close us out. Oh, thanks, Osman. Um, well, I guess I just wanted to, again, thank the speakers. I think I've been really enlightened. Um, you know, there's so many aspects of uh, decolonized global health that we have spoken about, but I think, you know, what I'm leaving with is uh, hope <laughs> that, you know, we're stronger together, that there's, you know, when it comes to the TRIPS waiver, when it comes to um, just rethinking um, how we interact with our environment and space, I, you know, we're stronger together and we're all on this road for, like you said, Osman, um, um, a moral, uh, ethical, and like social responsibility um, in global health. And, and like uh, Dr. Michelle said, you know, um, we can kind of get rid of the myth <laughs> that global health is for social good by reconstructing it to actually be that way. Um, so yeah, thank you Osman for excellent sharing as well. And I guess those are the final words. Thanks everyone who has joined today. Uh, so just one last thing, uh, Scott, uh... Scott, who's helped uh, behind the scenes organize everything, and uh, you know, big thank out uh, thanks uh, to the whole Channel House team that supported this. Uh, Scott, just one last thing: could you please share the the links to the papers of all the speakers in the in the chat so that uh, people have access to those links? And with that, thank you, everyone. Have a, have a great rest of your, rest of your day, and hopefully, we'll see some of you at the conference for public health in Africa, which starts, I believe, from tomorrow. So thanks, everyone, and. Uh, Bye. Thank you, Thank you very much.